Uh, as, as Josh said, my name is Derek Delane. I have been on staff at the Summit Church now for the past six years. Uh, God has done amazing things there, and we are on our way to Nashville, Tennessee. We're leaving uh, this coming June. And so uh, I've heard a lot about Integrity Church. As a matter of fact, there have been a lot of people that have actually been at my campus uh, over the past several years that this church has poured into. And so we had ready-made disciples that came that we were able to commission uh, into the work in the RDU area. So I'm thankful for Integrity Church. I'm thankful that I have an opportunity to come here and open up God's word with you all this, this morning. So uh, as way of introduction, again, I'm thankful for this church. I'm thankful for Pastor Ben. Thankful for your staff. As a matter of fact, why don't you put your hands together in thankful for, thankfulness for what God has been doing here. If you guys have your Bible, which I hope you do, why don't you turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. We're going to be looking specifically in verses 9 and 10 uh, this, this morning. Uh, listen. You guys have been in this series. I have an opportunity to, to, to close it out today uh, where you've been talking about the, the spiritual blessings of God, what he's been doing, what, what he imparts to, to his people. And what I'm going to be talking to you about today is that he doesn't just give these things for kicks and giggles, right? When, when he gives you these spiritual blessings, we are called to, to go out and do something. And then the question that we have to ask ourselves is why, Right? Now, that question of why, it, if you stop and think about it, that question has, has been on the minds of the greatest philosophers in, in history all the way down to the toddler, the question of why. Why do we exist? Why do people do what they do? Why are cats a thing, right? Why do people run marathons and then put stickers on the back of their car just to rub it in our faces that they're better than us? Why do they do those things, all right? I was with my, my daughter uh, several years ago. She's now, she's about to turn nine. Several years ago when she was a toddler, we were driving around, and she's like, she's like, Daddy, do you, do you love me? I was like, yeah. Why? Well, because you're my daughter. Why am I your daughter? Well, because God decided to give you to me. Why did God give me to you, right? Well, I guess because he thought that I was a good dad. Why did he think you'd be a good dad? And it was in that moment that I realized, hmm, I might not be a good dad because <laughs> I am losing my patience. <laughs> if I were to ask that question why, if we were to begin to ask that question of why, why does the church exist? Why do we do the things that we do? I'm sure that many of you guys would have differing, different opinions on, on that question, that, that answer. Right? Why does the church exist? Well, some would say for fellowship, right? Some would say to be encouraged by, by music. Some would say, well, to find that, that special someone, right? And some of you guys, as soon as I said that, you're like, well, where's mine, right? <laughs> Maybe the church isn't a spot for, for that. Listen, what we're going to see today, those, those spiritual blessings that God has, has given us, they, they empower us to go on and, and do some things. Spoil alert. The church, we exist to proclaim the excellencies of Jesus Christ. That is what we exist to do in the good and the bad and the highs and the lows. We are called to proclaim, okay? Now, before we dive into this, right, I, I know that I'm a chocolate preacher, right? Uh, I have had the benefit of being around different, you know, ethnicities and, and multiracial churches and, and things like that. And so I've come to realize that in some spaces, right, I'm going to get an amen, right? And that encourages me because that's what I'm used to in Jesus' name. I also know that I, when I'm around my white brothers and sisters, when I have a good word, they're like, ooh, and they write it down, okay? So I know, <laughs> I know that I'm going to have that, that in here. But to encourage me a little bit, y'all can speak to me, all right? Let's, let's, let's be family, all right? We're, we're done with the, with the cordialness, all right? Let's, let's be family here today, all right? Now, I want to ask a question of you that I really want you to stop and think about. How well are you proclaiming what Jesus has done for you? How well are you proclaiming what Jesus has done for you? If you're like me and if you're honest, right, probably not as well as what we should be doing. Why is that? Well, I think it's because that we have forgotten the depths of what Jesus has done for us. Now, we don't meditate on, on the goodness, right? Because when we, we, when we begin to think about those spiritual blessings, what he has given us, it demands a response, right? Every good gift demands a response. I don't, I don't give my, my kids toys and things on Christmas just for them to say, 
hmm, right? I want them to appreciate it because I just spent, you know, what little money I have, right? I think we forget the depths of what Christ has done for us. Because I know that you guys are, are good students and note takers, I want you to write this down, okay? The promises and grace of Jesus fuels our proclamation of Jesus. I'm going to say that again. The promises and grace of Jesus fuels our proclamation of Jesus. And this is what I mean by that. In 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, it reads like this. But you are a chosen race. I want you to think about these things, these blessings here, okay? You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you're God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Guys, I'll say it again. The promises and grace of Jesus fuels our proclamation of Jesus. As we look at this passage today, I'm going to be upfront and honest with you. Peter is writing to believers. There are many of you in this room who are believers that you need to hear this and encourage you today. But at the same time, I know that there are people in this room who don't know who Jesus is. And I don't want you to check out here. Even though this is written to, to Christians, to those who are walking with Jesus, I don't want you to check out. Because in fact, in verses 7 and 8 of this same passage, he talks about those who aren't yet believing. But here's the thing. I, I hope that you can lean in a little bit today and get a glimpse of the glorious grace of Jesus Christ. And that you would leave out of here forever changed because you're following him today. And so with that being said, let me pray for our time, and then we'll jump right in, all right? God, you are good. You are greatly to be praised. We thank you that we have an opportunity to open up your word, to be challenged by it, to see it, uh, for, or see you for, for who you are, how you love us and care for us, in spite of us, God. In the midst of our sin, Jesus, you've run towards us. And I pray that that would encourage us today as we hear this that these spiritual blessings, these promises that we have, Father, that that should fuel our proclamation of your goodness. Lord, let the, let the words of my, my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. God, you are my strength and my redeemer. Move me out of the way and have your way. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So, three things I want for us to see today. The promises we have in Jesus, the power of grace, and the purpose of the church. Number one, the promises we have in Jesus. Read with me again in verse 9. It says, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. Now here's the thing. Peter is using this section of scripture again to encourage the persecuted church in Asia Minor. And I love what he does in these two verses of scripture. He's using a lot of Old Testament references to encourage his church. And the Old Testament references that, that he's using, he's talking to uh, the, the Israelites in, in Egypt. And then he also talks about the, uh, the, the uh, Israelites when they were enslaved to Babylon. And so what he's saying to the to persecuted church in Asia Minor, hey, listen, you guys aren't alone in this, right? There was once a group of people who went through persecution just, just like you guys are. But, but God told them some specific things that you need to be reminded of as well as you're walking through your own journey, your highs and lows. And what's the first thing that he tells them? He says that you are a chosen race. He says you're a chosen race. This phrase, a chosen race, it echoes the book of Isaiah, Isaiah 43, which announces that God himself is Israel's savior, that he is the one that has come to redeem them and exile them from Babylon. This, this chosen group of, of individuals, they all stem from a common lineage, which was Abraham. And so now Peter is saying, well, we also have a common lineage as well, that we were broken, that we could not save ourselves, and we came to a realization that we needed Jesus. And we, we rested and trusted in the finished work of Jesus Christ, and so now we too are chosen. And this chosen race, it belongs to God, not because of anything that they did or how attractive they were, how much money they had. All those different things, no, they were chosen because God decided, this is who I wanted. And not only were they chosen, it says that they are a new race. 
And I love this because this, this chosen race of individuals are made up of, of people who don't look like what you would think they would look like. It's a diverse group of people who are coming under an understanding of who, of, uh, of who Jesus was. And so what that means for, for you and me right now in this moment, that we have brothers and sisters in Christ that do not look like us. That you have more in common with me as, as a black man because I know who Jesus is just as much as you know who Jesus is. We are family. And here's the thing. I am unapologetically black. <laughs> I am beautifully and wonderfully made, and my wife would agree in Jesus' name, <laughs> right? However, I belong to a race that's greater than my own. If you are in Christ Jesus, you belong to a race that is greater than your own. That doesn't mean that we ignore who we are and what God has done for us. In fact, what that means is as brothers and sisters in Christ, now we have the opportunity to come together and lean in on each other. In the midst of struggles, in the midst of, of ups and downs, not as this political scheme, no, but as a way for us to show John 13, the fact that we belong to Jesus by the way how? We love one another, that we care for one another because we're brothers and sisters in Christ. And that's the beauty of the diverse church that God has called this chosen people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. And if that's true, if that's true, then one implication is that the makeup of, of, of our local churches, it should reflect the diversity of people's living in our community. God chooses the unalike. People who would not have been friends because of their ethnicity, their age, their socioeconomic status, background, whatever. These individuals are built into the church, and God has made them into a family. And that is good news for every single one of us. Because here's the thing, inside of every single one of us is this desire to, number one, to belong to something, and then number two, to be chosen, right? When, when I talk about the conversation of, of, of being chosen, right, think back in, in middle school, right, when it was PE class or, you know, you're on the playground, right, and they were picking teams for dodgeball or basketball, whatever the case may be, you ain't want to be chosen last, did you? Be honest, no. No one wanted to be chosen last. Even as I'm talking about this, you were just rushed with the anxiety of remembering what middle school was like, right? Oh, my gosh, please don't pick me last, right? And I hate it if someone picked me second because then I was like, oh, I'm going to beat that guy, right? Like we, we want to be chosen. We want to, to, to belong. And, and here's the thing. That didn't just end in middle school. That, that followed us all the way up into our, our adulthood, Right? Some of us want to be chosen so badly, so, so desperately, that sometimes we even compromise our standards just to be chosen. Think about it. In our, in our dating relationships, right? We want to be chosen so badly that when God calls us into a, a holy sexual ethic, we will kind of compromise a little bit to just get what we want. However, so oftentimes we're still chosen over, Right? We, we think about it with our, with our jobs. We, we compete. We want to, to get that promotion, and oftentimes that promotion is given to someone else, and what does that do to us? It breaks us. We work so hard for that thing, and we still didn't get it. Some of you are, are in the midst of struggles right now in your marriage where your spouse has chosen another uh, person over you, and that has just devastated you and, and crushed you, that this was supposed to be this picture-perfect marriage. Guys, we want to be chosen so badly, and some of you will be disappointed that you will never be chosen here in this life. But if I can encourage you with anything today, what this passage says, God wants you. God wants you. He chooses the ones who want to be chosen, and he chases down the ones who desire to choose other things over him. Listen, your sin and your shame that you think are too great, that you're embarrassed to let anyone in on, God knows it, and he still chooses you. Listen, like, like every other sermon that I prepare, I listen to music, right, because the Holy Spirit moves better when there's music playing, right? Um, that's what we say anyway. So, um, there was a song that came on, I Choose You by Willie Hutch. You guys familiar with that song? No? I, I choose you, baby, and I'll tell you why. Oh, y'all don't know that song. <laughs> All right. 
So I got to talk to Pastor Ben about discipling you guys in some good music. What in the world? Either that or you guys are too holy. I don't know what it is. But listen, I, I love that song. Because Willie Hutch, he's going through this list of things as to why he's choosing this girl, right? She, she stuck with him in the tough times. She was good to him when other people weren't. All these different things. She's so beautiful and great. And so he's like, man, I'm choosing this girl over all the other girls in the world. And the Holy Spirit in his goodness, while I was literally on this section, that song came on. And I was reminded that God chooses us when we have nothing to offer. We bring absolutely nothing to the table. We're not pretty. We don't stick by him. We are unfaithful, and yet he still chooses us. That right there is a preaching moment right there. That's good stuff. He chooses us, and it doesn't stop there. In fact, the next three we go on to see is just, just as great. He goes on to say that we're a royal priesthood. To comprehend this, we need to understand the role of a priest in ancient Israel. A priest had special access to God on behalf of the people. They would go to God for the people. They would ask God to, to do things for the people. They would deliver messages to the people from God. A priest had direct access to God. And in order for that to happen, the priest had to be fully sanctified and set apart from the people at large for the ministry of God with who they had special access to. Now catch this. And God's saying that his people are a part of the royal priesthood themselves. He is stating that as a whole, the entire nation, as a whole, those who have come to understand who Jesus is, as a whole, we are called to be set apart from the nations of the world to serve God through obedience in this covenant that was made with him. But now Peter, he has the audacity here to say that you and I, once we come to know who Jesus are, that we are are those priests, and we are to perform the same function as a priest, that, that by obedience to this new covenant in Christ's blood, we are to, to be sanctified and set apart from the peoples of the world. But what must not be forgotten is the fact that as a priest, you and I, we have direct access to God. <laughs> uh, what? <laughs> We, can, we forget that. The, the creator of the universe, we have access to him. We're not jumping through any special hoops. We're not doing any special ceremonies or anything. We can talk to God, and he talks to us. And if we just stop and think about that for just a, a second, man, the application out of this is maybe we just need to shut down and just go home and just spend time with God because we can. It's amazing. And he knows us by name, and he allows us to step into that. But he doesn't stop there. He goes on to say that we're a holy nation. Peter continues building on this new covenant theme, and he is stating that even though they are, are, are part of the culture of their time, they belong to this new nation constituted as believers in Christ. See, this designation of believers as a holy nation, it reinforces this concept of obedience and sanctification that takes place as being a part of a, the royal priesthood. And it doesn't refer much to their, their moral status, but to their calling as a people set apart for God. And therefore, then, a calling to moral quality. You see, ancient Israel's holiness as a nation derived from the holy king of the universe. He had cut this covenant with them, binding them to himself as his chosen nation, his special possession. We are a holy nation. And here's the thing. When we talk about holiness, we need to understand it in, in two ways. There's this positional holiness and practical holiness. We need to be reminded as from a positional standpoint that we are holy because God says that we are. God has deemed that you are holy. And you need to remember that because there are going to be times in your life you're going to do something sometime this week, you're going to sin, <laughs> and you're going to be reminded by the accuser that you're trash. And that's not true. We are holy because God says that we are. And we need to bank on that. We need to live by that. You see, though, so there's this positional holiness but just because we're holy, that doesn't give us the, the freedom to just sin it up. 
right? Which is the second piece, there's this practical holiness, right? Our behaviors, living out what Scripture says. In fact, in, in 1 Peter chapter 1, the, the passage right before this one, it says this, but as he who called you is holy, that's God, saying that you know, you're holy, that's God, you also be holy in all your conduct. He says you must be holy in all your conduct. Why? Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I'm holy. The question for you to consider today, does your life look holy like the one who is calling you into holiness? To put it a different way, do you look like your daddy? Do you look like your daddy? You know, I, I already mentioned my kids, but I'll mention them again because those are easy illustrations, right? My, my kids, when they were younger, my wife would take them to the mall and, and things like that. And she used to get so frustrated. People would come up to her and be like, dang, you just must have, you must have carried those babies, right? Because they look just like their daddy, whatever they say, right? You know what I'm talking about? That rude comment, don't say that to moms. They'll slap you so fast, right? <laughs> my wife ain't slapping nobody. She wanted to, but... Y'all pray for us. So they, she, they would say that to her, right? Those babies look just like their dad. And then when she would come home and tell me that, I'm like, well, they should, right? <laughs> they better. <laughs> right? I'm, I'm their father, right? They should have qualities that resemble me. They've got things that I do that they do, right? When they get frustrated, that's you, right? That's... <laughs> But all the other stuff, that's me, right? They should look like me. Guys, do we look like our Father? When he says, be holy like I am holy, are you looking at your life and taking an inventory of what it looks like and what you're doing, and does it mirror your Father in heaven? That's what it means to be holy. That's what it means to be set apart. He says, hey, you're set apart because you are to be like me. Which leads to our final promise. We are people for his own possession. Essentially, we belong to God. And I, and I love this because this is an allusion to Exodus and Isaiah, where, where God refers to his holy nation in the context of the Exodus, and then later on in the Babylon exile, respectively. And as the people, out of all the peoples of the world, out of all the nationalities, out of all these individuals that could have been chosen, God says, nope. These are my people. These are the ones that belong to me. And here's the thing. If these promises, if these spiritual blessings are ours in Jesus Christ, then we are God's possession. Man, and again, if, I, if we just stop and thought about that, if we just meditated on that for just a little bit, our lives would change if we rested in this. If we understood that we were God's possession, that all of us, not only are we a chosen race, not only are we a holy nation, not only are we all these things that we've covered, we are a possession of God. What that means for you and me is that God takes care of what's his. God takes care of his things. Yeah, there's some stuff that, that hurts, right, and it's frustrating. It takes us by surprise, but it doesn't take God by surprise. Because he is in control of our lives. Guys, when we are being walked through the valleys in a way that is both gracious and generous and loving and in areas that we can't even see, we are his possession. He is jealous for us. He is fighting for us. He, he wants our affections and he wants his name to be manifested in our lives. He is for you because you belong to him. Family, if we are in Christ, we are a chosen race. We're a royal priesthood. We're a holy nation. We are God's special possession. And this isn't a, a maybe sort of type of thing. This is a promise. This is what he says. And it only comes about through Jesus Christ. Which leads me to my second point, the power of grace. Read verse 10 with me. Once you were not a people, but now you're God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Guys, before you can claim the promises that are yours in Jesus, you must remember where you came from. You see, when we remember where we've come from, we can then appreciate the power of grace even more. 
And I love this. Peter continues this, this Old Testament excursion by jumping to the book of Hosea. This, this section in, in verse 10 is a direct quote from, from Hosea. And if you're not familiar with the, with the book of Hosea, um, it, it's, a, it's a story about uh, this prophet that God, uh, he comes to and he talks to and says, hey, I want you to go marry uh, a prostitute. Parents, I'm sorry. Uh, if you may have to explain it later, my bad. I should have thought about that. That's, that's on me. They weren't, they're not going to ask me to come back. <laughs> so this, this, he, he tells her to marry this woman, but the unfortunate thing is she continues her profession. She's continuing on in this lifestyle. And God says to Hosea, hey, you, you go marry this woman. And she's still doing this thing. But what God was trying to get at, what he was trying to, to paint a picture for this prophet to see is, hey, in the same way that I'm telling you to marry this unfaithful woman, that's what's happening with me. That I have committed myself to the nation of Israel, and they are cheating on me regularly. They are selling themselves to things regularly. They are pursuing cheap thrills regularly. They are doing this thing regularly. And I want you to get a taste of this. I want you to see what it is. But what eventually happens is Gomer, as she's continuing on, that's his wife, continuing on in this, this lifestyle, she eventually finds herself in a spot with a man who abuses her, and then puts her in the marketplace to be sold. And what happens, God speaks to Hosea in chapter 2, and this is what Peter is quoting. As a matter of fact, in Hosea chapter 2, verse 19, I'll read it. He says this, I will betroth you to me forever. I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice and steadfast love and in mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord and in that day I will answer, declares the Lord, I will answer the heavens, and they shall answer the earth, and the earth shall answer the grain, and the wine, and the oil, and they shall answer Jezreel. And I will sow her for myself in the land, here it is, and I will have mercy on no mercy, and I will say to not my people, you are my people, and he shall say, you are my God. He says this to Hosea, and then he turns to Hosea, and he says, hey, go get your wife. You step into the marketplace and you buy your wife back. And what does Hosea do? He does it. Could you, you just fathom that for like two seconds? That's bananas to me. And yet he's obedient and he does it. And then he looks at Gomer and he says, hey, you belong to me and I belong to you. You're not going to do this anymore. You are my wife. God tells Hosea to redeem their relationship. Why? Because that is what God intended to do with his people. He says, I will have mercy on those people who have no mercy. I will make those people who are the, the not my people people, I'm going to make them my people. And Peter here has the audacity to say that this is what's taking place now. That God, through the perfect life of his son, Jesus, his death on the cross for our sins, his, his resurrection, showing that he was strong enough to overcome death and our sin, stepped into the marketplace, and he bought us back, and we belong to him, and he belongs to us. Amen. That, again, is the preaching moment right there. Because I, I, I'll use it, a, I'll, I'll paint the picture a different way. So uh, one of the, the, the best highlights of my job, I get to officiate a lot of weddings. At the Blue Ridge campus, a ton of young professionals, people get married all the time. That's fun. I love it, right? It's a lot. <laughs> I've lost count of how many weddings I've done, but this is not tongue-in-cheek. Literally, every wedding that I've officiated, the bride is always the most beautiful girl in the room. Always. Homegirl is flawless, right? Immaculate. Hair on fleek, everything, right? <laughs> But I don't know if you guys know this or not, but leading up to the wedding day, so I, I only found this out, so my wife, she's a cosmetologist, she does hair and makeup and all that stuff. I, I found this out after we started uh, dating and you know, got married, that there's, a, there's these trial runs that the brides go through before they get married. Y'all know that? I ain't know. <laughs> I'm letting y'all in on a little secret here, right? So like, I'm talking about weeks and months beforehand they will go to the, to, the, to the makeup artist, and they'll do a trial run. 
to be like, okay, hey, that needs to uh, happen. You know, use this makeup, cover that up, right? They'll, they'll do the hair a certain way. So I'm like, all right, that was easy to kind of set in place, right? Why? So that the day of, they ain't playing no games. <laughs> they know what's happening. And the reason why, because they want to set the bride up in such a way that when she comes around the corner, that, that the groom homeboy, oh, he a mess, right? <laughs> Knees buckling, snot nose, everything, right? Because he, they, they want him to see his bride for who she is. Beautiful. The most beautiful girl in the room. Guys, that is what Jesus does for us. He, he covers all of our blemishes. All the, the hair that's out of place, he's covered it up. All the, all the pimples of addiction, they're covered. All the, all the breakouts and, and dry skin of, of, of deceit, covered. He does all of that. Now, here's the thing. I'm not trying to knock the bride, right? We know she don't really look like that, right? <laughs> we know that the next day her hair ain't, you know, flawless, right? She can't pay the cosmetologist to do that every single day, right? We know that. If we're honest with ourselves, we know what's really going on on the inside. But yet, here's the thing. Unlike the bride, we are covered fully forever. Amen. There is no change. There is no change whatsoever. Because Jesus lived the life that we could not live. He died the death that we deserve to die. And our brokenness and our shame and everything, again, that we will want to hide, he has fully covered. I love the book of Matthew. It says that Jesus is the bridegroom, that he's the one waiting for us. And because he has done all the work, because we are fully covered, when that day comes, when we see him face to face and we're coming around the corner, he's looking down the aisle and he says, man, that's the most beautiful girl in the room. You and I, we are the most beautiful girl in the room. As silly as that is, you're going to remember that forever. <laughs> Guys, you are immaculate. You're covered. You're beautiful because of what Christ has done for you. You can take that to the bank. He claimed us to be his. And if that's true, this is the moment where we put the pens down, we lift our eyes to heaven, and we say, and can it be that thou would die for me? Knowing all the flaws, you would do this for me? This is the pinch me in my dreaming moment. <laughs> this is what he does for us. God sent Jesus so we could be fully known and fully loved. And guys, that's amazing grace. Amen. That is the power of grace. Now, I mentioned earlier to those in the room who may not know who Jesus is, this is the moment here for you, that you have to stop and be honest with yourself, that there might be some brokenness and hurt in your life, and you've been trying to fix yourself. Can I tell you something from experience? You cannot save yourself. You, if you had 10,000 lifetimes, you could not live a perfect life enough to be accepted. So Jesus paid the price for you. And it's as simple as repenting of your sin and believing in the work that he's done. That simple. And then what we see, all these blessings and uh, promises and everything that we just talked about, that's yours. His, his, his sacrifice for your life. His, his abandonment for your adoption. That can be yours. But here's the thing, like I said earlier, every good gift demands a response. And this is for all of us in the room now here at this moment. Remember I asked that question? How well are you proclaiming the excellencies of Jesus Christ? You see, when we stop and think about these, these promises, these, these spiritual blessings, this, this grace that we have, it demands a response. We cannot and should not sit down and just think, oh, well, praise Jesus for his goodness, right? 
No, he now calls us in to action, calls us in to proclaiming who he is and what he's done, which leads me to my final point, the purpose of the church. That question of why that I asked earlier, here we are. Why are these promises that we have through Christ Jesus given to us? Why are these spiritual blessings given to us? Why are these gifts given to us? To empower our purpose. And what is that purpose? Let's look at the second part of verse 9. It says that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Guys, he made us a chosen race so that. He made us a royal priesthood so that. He made us a holy nation so that. We are God's possession so that. We did not have mercy, now we have mercy so that. We weren't his people, now we are his people so that. We may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. As our purpose as proclaimers of God is tied into what he has done for us. What he has now made us. That is our purpose. We have been given this mission of verbal proclamation. We are to make much of God, to pursue his fame. You see, Peter links God's excellencies with his saving work and calling his readers out of, out of darkness into his marvelous light. We are people who have been brought out of darkness into light, and now we are called to go and, and seek to display that light to those who are still in darkness. And this has always been the mission of the church, always, uh, all the way in uh, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Why? To tell the truth about him and the truth about what he has done through Jesus. It's supremely excellent. Nothing has changed in our day. As a royal priesthood, as a holy nation, the church is called to proclaim the excellencies of God's marvelous saving act in Jesus. That is the reason why we are moving to Nashville, Tennessee. Guys, does it look like I like country music? <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm trying to like it, but boy, that's hard. <laughs> that's hard. Y'all pray for your boy. But that's why we're moving to Nashville, Tennessee. A hundred people a day are moving into the area. There, there are people, the, the city as a whole is becoming more and more post-Christian. Once upon a time, people would say, you know how the South is the, is the Bible Belt? They would joke around and say that Nashville is the buckle. <laughs> you got three mainline denominations headquartered right in the city. Publishing arms who produce Bibles on Bibles and Bibles in the city. But yet there's over 70% of the people who would say that they aren't walking with Jesus. We're called to go proclaim the excellencies of the one who's called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. We need to learn to enjoy talking about who he is and what he's done for us. The question for you today, are you carrying the excellencies of Jesus anywhere? Is Jesus, as the gospel of Jesus, so dear to you? Are you so blown away with this idea of being called out of darkness that you are willing to do what he's called you to do? And if not, why? Why? If we're honest, I think a lot of times it isn't that we don't understand the call of, of being obedient to going and make disciples. I don't think that's a problem that we have at all. I would say that we suffer from what Paul David Tripp calls awe amnesia. What I mean by that, we don't meditate on the goodness of Jesus Christ and what he's done for us. We have gotten to the spot, and I'm, and I'm speaking to someone who grew up in the South. We, we have come to the spot where we become so just, just focused on, hey, hey this, is, this is just a way of life. Christianity, yeah, my grandma's Christian, right? And yeah, I believe in Jesus. Right? We, we live this way as if somehow we deserve what Christ has done for us. We don't. We don't. That's why it's called grace. We don't deserve any 
of it at all. Somehow I fight to believe that I deserve to be a son of God. I believe the lie that somehow I earn this standing. I believe the lie that I'm somehow good enough. And when I believe those lies, I lose sight of the gospel. That I couldn't earn it and I didn't deserve it. Do you ever find yourself there sometimes? Are you ever in that spot? I heard one pastor say it this way, a good friend of mine. That when we don't live as God says, it's often an indicator that we don't see as God sees. What do you not see in your life? We have to remember where we came from. That is just the reality. But we don't remember there just to stay in that spot of woe is me, no. We remember the goodness of God in redeeming us and rescuing us out of that. And then everything that he has done for us, we can't help but reach out to others and say, hey, (laughs) come and see. Come and see. Look at this. Listen, can can I be honest with you guys? We are not the most convincing. That's country music. I hear it. I've got an ear for it now. Contextualization. Guys, we are not the most convincing thing about the Christian faith. We're not. (laughs) <laughs> Boop, popped your bubble. <laughs> we are not the most convincing thing about the Christian faith. The most convincing thing is God and who he is and what he has done with the most unconvincing people. I, I find it hilarious to this day that, and I ain't going to go into all my backstory because then y'all might not ever have me back, but I run into people from time to time before I knew Jesus And when they know what I'm doing now, they're like, what? (laughs) You are a pastor? And I'm like, yeah, right? Look at God. (laughs) Look at God. That is the only response that we have. That God can take the most broken individual, the most lost person, and draw them in to who he is and his work. (laughs) The Bible is littered with people who have a backstory, and God still uses them. The Bible is littered with broken people. All your Bible heroes, if you dig in deeper, you like, dag. <laughs> These were messed up people. And God uses the messed up, broken individual. Why? So that person can't steal the glory. <laughs> but here's the thing. That's all there is, is broken people. We're all messed up. We all have a story. But it finishes with God and who he is and his grace. So, how can you proclaim the excellencies of God who called you out of darkness to his marvelous light? I said it already, but I think it starts with remembering where you came from. I don't think I can stress this enough. Again, you don't sit in this woe is me posture, but you must remember where you've come from. You have a testimony, right? Use that to point people to Jesus. If you trusted Christ, you are free from all the mess of the past. We just read it in in Romans 8. There's now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You are no longer condemned. You don't have to condemn yourself by remembering your past. You remember that you are free in Christ Jesus. However, that freedom from condemnation, again, we don't deserve it. We are guilty of sin. We all have fallen short of the glory of God, but we received it, and for that reason, it should force us to look to Jesus and worship for what he has done for us. So it starts with remembering, but it also requires us to live our lives in such a way that we're pointing people to Jesus. Will you make mistakes? Yep. Will you mess up? Yep. Every single day. But through the power of the Holy Spirit, We fight to live our lives in such a way that when people ask why we aren't living like X, Y, Z or doing that, it gives us a chance to speak of our status as holy people set apart by Jesus' blood shed for us, which means we also need to use our mouths. Yes, we live a life worthy of what we have been called out of, but then we speak about what Jesus has done. We tell of the goodness of the Lord. Romans 10, 14 paints this picture for us when it says, How then will they call on him in whom they have not believed? 
And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? God has placed you strategically in your classroom, in your job, in your neighborhood, at the gym. He has placed you there for a purpose. Are you utilizing that? Have you received these blessings and you're just sitting on them? Or are you going to remember you've been given them for a purpose? To proclaim the excellencies of Jesus Christ by telling of what he's done. Who in your life needs to hear about the excellencies of Christ? And what's keeping you from telling them? What is keeping you from telling them? That is our purpose, church. The promises and grace of Jesus, they fuel our proclamation of Jesus. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you're God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you've received mercy. Rest in that today.